on camera. Today is April 20th, 2017, and my name is Tony Hilliard. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center, and with me is Sue Verhoff, the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the History Center here in Atlanta. We're here today with Mr. Bill Craig to record the oral history of his military service in the U.S. Marine Corps during the Vietnam War. Mr. Craig's oral history is being recorded for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. We're honored to have you with us today, Bill, and uh, thank you for participating in the project. Uh, would you begin by telling us uh, your name and where you live, please? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me here and uh, really appreciate it. Um, my name is uh, Bill Craig, and I live in Ballground, Georgia. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about your early years, your early life? Uh, it, you know, I could go back as um, during my child, early childhood. I, I lived uh, in and around Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we, we traveled some. I went to uh, different states uh, due to my father's employment, uh, places like uh, Virginia, Kentucky. Uh, one time we went to Texas. Uh, I'm originally from uh, a little town in North Carolina called uh, Eaton, North Carolina, up on the East Coast. Um, that's uh, where I was born in my grandparents' house. Um, that's uh, where my mother was born and, and grew up. And so on my mother's side, that's where we seemed uh, to return a lot, if you will. Uh, during my childhood, it was uh, a lot of turbulence or my father was uh, had a drinking problem, and it seems like we ended up pulling up stakes a lot, moving. Uh -huh. um, we used to joke about it every time the rent come due, you know, we were gone. Uh, but our safe haven probably was uh, in my grandmother's mother's place in Eaton, North Carolina. Uh, when my brothers and I uh, were there, it was I had three brothers. Uh, it was just um, happy times, uh, you know, got plenty to eat of, you know, grandmother's cooking. Um, but as time, uh, you know, continued, we uh, always seemed to end up around the uh, Georgia area. Uh, that's where my father's from. Uh, he was uh, originally from Henry County area. The uh, as time went on, uh, my father disappeared for a while um, during my early preteens and early teens. I was uh, attending uh, one of the local high schools. I went to about the 11th grade, I believe 10th or 11th, over on the west end side of Atlanta. Uh, again, my mother was trying to raise four, four sons uh, by herself. And so times were hard and, um, you know, things like my older brother got in a little trouble and I was always hanging out with my big brother. And uh, so it was a situation between school grades and a combination of things. Uh, uh, my mother at that time, whether she was just looking out for me or, or just, I really don't know the reason why, uh, she suggested that I go live with my grandmother up in North Carolina. Well, I was, you know, kind of in between at first, you know, then, so I make the trip up there. I how to, old were you at this time? Uh, that was um, 15 or 16, okay. I think. And uh, as it turns out, I went through, the, I started during the summertime and I worked with my uncle who was a, a painter, uh, as, uh, his father before him. and. Uh, so when the school season started, um, I found out that I had, if I was going to remain there with my grandmother, I had to repeat a grade. So I ended up repeating um, the 11th grade, I believe it was. And uh, as, as time rolled along, uh, I become, you know, happily accustomed to living with my grandmother. Uh, you know, I gained weight, going from a skinny kid to you know, you know, some extra pounds here and there. Uh, it was one of those things where I didn't mind working. Uh, my grandmother wasn't uh, financially able to 
to help put clothes on my back or do a lot of things other than you know, maybe feed me and house me. I ended up working uh, maybe weekends at uh, one of the local supermarkets there in town. And during the summer, I, I worked full time. So I didn't get a chance to participate in sports or other that many activities at school. Um, I had some cousins uh, there in the high school that, you know, we, we hung out and, you know, other friends. And there wasn't much to do in that type of uh, environment or that type of uh, small town atmosphere. You'd wear, you get into the car with your friend or if you're driving and you ride from one end of town to the other end of town, circle back around and go back the same way. Uh, you go to Joe's Drive-In and back to the, the waterfront, as we called it. We were right there on the, the what they call the Albemarle Sound. Okay. And uh, so, you know, it was um, really an uneventful two years or more. And um, other than, it, you know, I, I obviously kept in touch with my mother. Uh, so things rolled along and I was doing well in school. Um, obviously a lot of things come up during high school. What you gonna do after school? Are you gonna go to college? Well, I knew at that point in, you know, there weren't any scholarships available. And uh, so I knew I, I had to kind of look into the future. The Marine recruiters, as all of the recruiters come to school during mm -hmm. those times, and uh, uh, I had a uh, interview with the recruiter, and one thing led to another, and I signed up for the 120-day delay plan, I believe it was. What year was this? About what year was this? I'm sorry. What year was this? This is 1965. Okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so. That being said, um, I, you know, obviously I had to confer with my grandmother. I was, I believe I was 17 at that time. And also I had to get things signed by my mother uh, for the legality of things. And so that was my plans after I graduated. You know, once uh, that would be in June, uh, upcoming graduation. Uh, a little background on military family and all that is that my father was in World War II. He was uh, in the Marine Corps. Um, I don't know a lot of his history other than he he didn't go overseas or anything. He was stateside. I'm not sure where he was stationed, maybe uh, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, or maybe even Hawaii. I, I'm not sure of details. All I know is that he got a bad discharge. He got in trouble and uh, you know he used to joke about it and everything else. <clears throat> well uh, I remember back when evidently he must have come back home there in Georgia and I got on the phone with him one night there at my grandmother's and I was telling him I said you know I was going in the Marine Corps and um, I don't know if he had had a few drinks or what, but he said, well, you dumb SOB. And, you know, I, I didn't know how to take it jokingly or whatever. And I said, well, okay. <laughs> nice talking to you. And so uh, that was it, you know, from, from his side of it. Obviously, he was going by his, his experience and his, his time in the Corps. Uh, so anyway, uh, graduated from high school. And um, at that particular time, um, the, there was no actual recruiter in the small town area. Okay. Uh, Richmond, Virginia was the place where we had to actually travel to to get sworn in and go through the physical and all those things. So I left home around June the uh, 21st or something like that, went up to Richmond, Virginia, went through all the you know, ABCs of getting sworn in. And, and then we took, a, I believe it was either a train or a bus to Beaufort, South Carolina. Um, and to back up a little bit, needless to say, my grandmother 
was very, very emotional when I left. You know, we, uh, you know, we had been close, obviously, in, in the, all the years growing up, being with her and, and my grandfather before he passed. Uh, and my uncle and my aunt were involved with me at that time in our little surroundings. Uh, but after saying goodbyes to everyone, it was very emotional. Uh, so off I go and end up in Beaufort. Then we take the bus ride to, you know, the Yellow Brick Road as it ends up. And uh, there's no Wizard of Oz there. So anyway, we arrive in uh, the Pearly Gates there. And the rest is history from there. We get off the bus and the next thing we know, we're being hauled at, screamed at, um, do this, do that. And, you know, I'm scared like so many others. And uh, I was used to being hauled at by my father, so that <laughs> that wasn't that was surprising. But uh, anyway, it was a scary moment. Uh, so we uh, get into the, uh, basically an introduction into the real Marine Corps. And, uh, you know, meet all our drill instructors and we get into our barracks eventually after our uh, supplies are handed to us and all the preliminaries about that and and see the flags waving and and, and all the, the tears and the people coming hugging the uh, graduated uh, Marines. So the next step was uh, Campbell June or Camp Geiger which, which is the what they call the ITR training. Uh, it was infantry, infantry training, training regiment. Cool. And uh, so we were assigned to that uh, for I'll get whatever amount of time it was back then. Um, you go through things like uh, the uh, infiltration course, the uh, hand grenade range. Uh, uh, back then it was flame floor, flame floor, floor, you know, the thing that shoots out fire. So, uh, uh, just uh, a little bit of everything, maneuvers, you know, tactical maneuvers, combat maneuvers. Well, had you gotten an infant? Had you been assigned an infantry MOS yet? No, not okay. we had not been. Now, upon graduation, so right before graduation, we had been given our MOS. And a lot of guys uh, had been given uh, maybe a, a particular MOS that. Uh, didn't even require them to go to ITR, if I remember right, and I could be wrong on that. They were special, you know. Uh, a lot of the uh, recruits got uh, 0311, which was your basic infantry. Uh, my MOS was 0341, which was uh, 81 mortars. Uh, and so anyway, we basically knew that, if I remember correctly, we knew that going into it. So we get through ITR, and a lot of us from my boot camp, uh, my platoon, or you know, some of us kind of stayed together. And the ones that were all 341, we went to Camp Lejeune. And I believe we were assigned to the 1st Battalion, 8th Marines. <clears throat> so we get into our a newer environment again there at Camp Lejeune, Jacksonville, North Carolina. Again, you know we're uh, we're green as the day is long, and you're you're still still scared to a point where you know you don't know which direction is up. You're just kind of blindly following whoever's in charge, or or just hope you don't screw up. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, um, you're either, most of us are privates, not private first class. Uh, you know, you may be assigned to a squad leader if you're in a mortar platoon, and he may be a lance corporal. And so you get to meet the, the rank structure as it is, and you know, you may have a corporal, the sergeant may be a platoon sergeant or staff sergeant. So we do, uh, we do a lot of training, not only the physical, uh, 
you know, a, you know, physical training, PT and running and all those wonderful things. But uh, we trained with the 81 mortar. Um, and uh, based on the 81 mortar is a support weapon. It uh, is broken down into several pieces. Uh, you have, you know, what they call a, a sight box or a sight. And then you you know, have a, a tube, more what's called a mortar tube. You have a base plate. It's broken down into about two different parts. Um, and then you have a tripod, which is basically, if you can picture a, a base plate, a tube sticking up this way, and a tripod this way. So, um, and you learn every part of it. Not only you learn how to operate it, um, but, uh, and then each individual or, or, or part of the squad is assigned a particular part. You're assigned, if you're a squad leader, you're assigned the sight box, which is the, you know, the least heavy or the smallest piece. And then it goes on down the line. If you're assigned the base plate, you're at the bottom of the list because it weighs the heaviest. So, uh, and I was assigned the base plate in the very beginning uh, a lot of times. So, um, as time rolled along, uh, you know, I, I don't think anybody uh, in our platoon, our company, our battalion, uh, Vietnam was not talked about that much. I, I, you know, we didn't hear the news that much or read the papers that much. We uh, listened to rumors, we listened to whatever news we were able to get. Um, so, you know, the next thing I know, we are being um, deployed to, uh, we're going to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Now, again, I don't even think I've heard of, of uh, what is now called Gitmo, Gitmo Bay. Uh, but we were uh, given orders to go there, uh, and, and from what I found out as we were traveling by sea, is that they we're there for the security element. The Marines are, are stationed there, uh, along as a naval base, but we're, we do our part as far as the um, protection, if you will. And uh, so this was our my first ship voyage. We went from a place in North Carolina called Moorhead City uh, and we all were put into cattle cars back then and and, and, and driven to the, to the dock, loaded upon this ship, if you want to call it a ship. Uh, I just, it was just, just, to me it was just big gray mass sitting on the water. Now being from my little hometown in Eaton, I, you know, I'm used to boats. I, you know, go skiing, boat riding, fishing, or whatever. But I've never been on a, a big ship, obviously. So we get on board, all our gear, and you know, we shuffle around like a herd of goats. And uh, you know, anchors away, off we go. And obviously, we get introduced to the sailors in their own way, you know, and swabbies. You know, you know, all the names we had for them, they had names for us, Jarheads, uh, Bell, Hop, you know, all kinds of stuff. So uh, we're off, and um, they give you a little kind of preempt as to what to do if you get seasick. Well, it didn't take long for most of us. They, if you, you, you mostly you carried a, a helmet with you, you know, part of your gear. And it was long you were your, you know, backpack and, and everything else um, on board with you there. Uh, and so you take, if you didn't make it to the over the side, you had a helmet and they said, please don't throw up on the deck. So I, everybody, all the heaving and hoeing and through that very turbulent ride to, to uh, Cuba, and then when when you're down in the uh, the bunking area or down below, and needless to say, they're going to put you down in the belly of the ship, and that's where the Marines stayed, unless you are an officer or something. Uh, it was 
crowded to say the least. Uh, from what I remember, you know, the the bunks were stacked, and uh, the, the little not really bunks, but the sleeping room. Was this room. the battalion that went down there? Yeah, the battalion, the okay. whole battalion, um, first battalion, eighth Marines, and uh, we were. Um, like I say, you know, you didn't really get all the information or scuttlebutt, as we call it, uh, until you were there almost and ready to, you know, either on ship or get off. Uh, most of the the journey, uh, I don't even remember how long it took. It didn't take that long, uh, but we we landed, got off the ship, and we ended up going to um, uh, these barracks that obviously were from World War II era. And uh, it was just a, a little small base encampment of barracks and uh, a few buildings scattered around. And I, I remember just, you just, wow, you know, this is interesting. And you get there and, you know, you get assigned your barracks and your, your bunk and store your gear. And next thing you know, you have roll call or, but the whole battalion tries to get together and the battalion commander comes in and, you know, say, welcome to uh, Cuba. So, and then you learn your assignments and you, it's all about training again. And uh, it was like, you know, you're in a foreign country as far as you know, even though it's our base, <laughs> you know, and um, you're, you're told that the, the, the uh, guard duties or uh, purposes of, for being there, you know, you'll be able to see the Cubans, you know, looking out from their post, you know, looking at you as you're looking at them. You know, said so they may be smoking a Cuban cigar, I don't know. So uh, anyway, uh, I never saw Castro as far as that goes, but we spent uh, through the training and the different types of exercises that uh, we were given. Um, I do remember that we were able to see, uh, we called them flicks or movies back then. They had a set up uh, drive-in or a big uh, screen. Um, and the, one of the first movies I remember seeing back then was a James Bond movie. Uh, uh, what was it, Goldfinger. Okay. And I mean, everybody was just so excited to see a big movie, you know. So anyway, there was also, a, a, you know, I'm sure there was an officer's club somewhere, but we had like a little uh, NCO club or whatever they call it. And you were able to get some beer every now and then. You weren't allowed to go um, to the main base section because that's maybe where the PX was and uh, other contacts. I did go with a detail once or twice, and I learned that the uh, civilian employees throughout the base were Jamaican. I never could figure that out. I mean, we weren't that far from Jamaica, but all the employees there that worked on the base or whatever capacity were Jamaicans. So there were two sides to uh, Guantanamo Bay. There was the windward side and the leeward side. And we were on the windward side, from what I remember. Uh, and then, you know, I think back then, this was 65, 66, and uh, probably near May of 66 or somewhere before then, things begin to trickle in about what's going on over in Vietnam or, you know, things are building up. I think we were there for like six months at a time, every battalion or whoever was assigned there, six months assignment didn't come back to the States. So it was about that time that uh, we, were, we were going back as a battalion, back to Camp Lejeune. But at the same time, we got preparation or we were getting orders, uh, whoever was assigned to go uh, to be, uh, to California, to Camp Pendleton, and I was assigned to go. Um, I got a 30-day leave, and I went to uh, see my grandmother, and um, 
I don't remember going home in the Atlanta area to see my mother and my brothers. Um, but anyway, so it was about that time, and you know, I was able to uh, board a plane. I think out of uh, I think I got back over to Richmond. I think and and flew a plane to. Uh, I forgot the connections. It might have been to Atlanta or anyway. I got to California. And Camp Pendleton's near a town called uh, Oceanside. And uh, again, this was a, you know, supposed to be a looking like a fun place, California and sun and surf and and bikinis and all that. But you didn't really see that at first. I think when I got in, I uh, landed. I don't know if it was Los Angeles or wherever it was. And then you got, uh, eventually you got to Camp Pendleton and you were assigned your new uh, outfit, which the outfit I was assigned was the uh, 2nd Battalion, 26 Marines. And the way I understood it is that uh, the 5th Marine Division was being reactivated. And we were part, originally, originally we were part of the 5th Marine Division. Now, I'm not sure of all the mechanics of that. I, I could be off base. Uh, but uh, there was, like I say, 1st Battalion, 2nd Battalion, 3rd Battalion, uh, the 26 Marines. And um, I, I had gotten promoted to PSC uh, before I left to go to California, but uh, while I was over in Cuba or whatever. Uh, I was one of the first ones there, as it turns out. Um, I think it was a staff sergeant got there about the time I did, and you know people begin to trickle in, you know, from different locations, and uh, again I was just very kind of unsure of what was getting ready to happen. I think you know you you so they were just putting the unit together. Basically, we were yeah. just putting the unit together. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm sure either the first battalion or the second, the third battalion, or somewhere. I don't know if they were training somewhere else, or actually training there at Camp Pendleton. All I know, all I know is that I was with the second battalion, in our little area, and we were getting ready to do a lot of training. Is what was being thrown at us from the early stages. So anyway, we were beginning to form our platoon is 81 mortars. Uh, and then, you know, you have sections, or uh, basically you know, we have four sections basically in a, in a platoon. And there's squad leaders of each section or squads, you know. And uh, you have platoon sergeants and then you have a, you know, let's say a gunnery sergeant or then a lieutenant that's in charge of a 81 mortar Platoon, and usually the platoon may be assigned to what they call, you know, rifle companies, and so we're we're actually part of H and S Company, headquarters and service company, under that battalion. That's how we're mm -hmm. we're blocked in. And so you uh, begin to meet the NCOs and your fellow Marines, and begin to learn a little history about everybody and. And um, you know, smell the California air, and look at all these hills and and all this other stuff. And where's the chow hall when you're hungry? I mean, that's <laughs> one of the first things that come to your mind. And so, uh, the training begins. Uh, as it turns out, I don't know if it was because I was one of the first ones there. I uh, I'm, I'm eventually promoted to Lance Corporal. And I become a squad leader, so I take on that responsibility the best I can. And um, so our training, let's say, is around May, from May, June, July, close to anywhere two and a half to three months, somewhere in that ballpark, where we're we're doing various sorts of training, route, you know, overnight or bivouacs or you know, in the hills and firing missions and, you know, um, all kinds of, uh, you know, just combat training. I mean, you're doing just about everything. You go into these classes about 
jungle where you're going about, you know, what to do, what not to do. You know, you're talking about bungee pits and booby traps and the culture and the, you're, you're just, you're cramming all this stuff into us, trying to prepare us, you know, for what lays ahead. Because, I mean, everybody knows about that we're going to Vietnam. So um, we, we get to that point where it, we know it's getting close. And again, you know, as, as I was saying, um, you get so busy, you know, mentally and physically. Uh, but I do write home to my grandmother, uh, not as often as I should. And she writes often. My mother writes some, you know. Uh, you know, I never hear from my, my father. Uh, but anyway, you, you get, uh, you know, family's a big thing, particularly to, to some guys, and obviously it's to me too, but you know you're going, in, you know, to a, a foreign country halfway around the world or over the ocean. Uh, so anyway, you get through training, you're going in to the final stages, and they're preparing you uh, for another Bon voyage. You're going by ship. You're not going by a plane. I said, well, okay. So anyway, we prepare to board the ship out of San Diego. And another, this is a little bit better than the first ship. Uh, it's a, what they call the APA okay. troop carrier. And uh, I, I call it another sardine can. But, you know, anyway, we, we eventually board in uh, July, I believe it was, or early July, or late June. I, my dates are scrambled up, but anyway, uh, we finally get on board. Uh, we get adjusted again uh, as we pull out of the dock. You know, we, we, we hear from uh, our CO and our other higher-ups that this may take about a month, so 30 days, you know. So wow, <laughs> oh, Caribbean cruise or whatever you know. Well, believe me, it's not that. Uh, we we take off and it's the usual seasickness, getting adjusted to the to the to the food, the mess hall, uh, the bunking area, the closeness, the the constant getting on the deck, and doing physical training, and and you're constantly going to classroom training you know, brushing up on stuff, preparing yourself, whatever you could do, as, as much as you could do on board a ship. Uh, we were able to see flakes or movies occasionally with the sailors. And uh, there were a few fights every now and then between Marines and sailors. And, you know, some won, some lost, you know. And I'll leave it at that. But anyway, uh, as we are cruising along, and our first stop was Hawaii, Pearl Harbor. Um, you know, this was big excitement for all of us, actually. We were told that we were going to get three days' liberty, and I'm sure it was kind of, um, you know, portioned out, you know, as to who goes first, who does this. I went with, uh, when it was my time, I went with uh, some friends of mine, and, and uh, you know, we get prepared, you know, we were going to go get some beer or whatever. And uh, you know, I'm 19 at this time, and so obviously I can't go into a bar and legally drink. You know, there and most of us couldn't. Well, we ended up getting our beer and our liquor, but and going to the beach and you know looking at the the hula skirts and the waves and the surfing and you know all that stuff. Um, but going back to the legally drinking, I. I, you, know, you look at it then, you sure you're pissed off because you can't legally drink, yet I'm getting ready to go go fight, uh, or presumably, you know, to, in harm's way. But anyway, so you get on the beach. Uh, most of us, like myself, are very fair-skinned. Um, uh, you know, you get prepared lotion, you know, put a little lotion on, you drink a beer, you know, whatever. Put a little lotion on drink two more beers, you know, and the cycle continues. Well, by that time, you're feeling pretty good. Well, my buddy and mine say, well, hey, man, let's go learn how to surf. 
So we go down to beach area and whatever it was, and we get a, a surfboard and the guy says, well, this is how you do it. And, and I don't really remember whether I actually got up on a surf, but maybe I paddled out there. My buddy, I think he tried and he almost drowned. And, you know, we rescued him and we waddled back to our little area. Well, whether it was high noon or afternoon or whatever, I'm laying there. And I'm probably laying on my stomach. And the next thing I know, I, I, I wake up. I don't see my buddies. And, and I'm feeling kind of tight on my back. You know, it's still hot. And I'm kind of buzzing from the alcohol. And I realize I've laid out in the sun. And I've got a sunburn that you, you can imagine, you can picture whether it's second degree or whatever. Uh, so anyway, I'm able to get back to the ship and assume my duties as a squad leader and, and going to different you know things on the ship and right before we pull out probably. And um, you know back then and, and even now, and maybe it's a little different in the Marines, but our utilities or our, our dungarees or our working outfit, you know, we, we mainly starched them, you know, our utilities. And, you know, they had to look sharp. And so I was wearing one of my starch shirts under I had my, my T-shirt. but um, And I was, you know, red, puff face, the arms, or whatever. But somehow or another, my captain, my CEO, found out that I had gotten sunburned. Now he he, he was uh, he wasn't a a new captain. He'd been around a while. In fact, he might have been a mustanger, okay. a guy that the mustang means you were enlisted and then you became a uh, a CEO or a uh, officer. So anyway, I mean he knew me. You know he called me. Everybody's called by Craig or Lance Corporal Craig or Corporal or Sergeant whatever. And so I was walking right above the deck going somewhere, I forgot where it was. And um, he come by and and I, I think I, I saw him and I saluted him. And then I, he said, Craig, hey, how you doing? I'm doing fine, sir. And I was, you know, trying not to show that I was hurting so bad I could hardly stand up. And he said, well, good to see you. <laughs> Pats me on the back. And I'm almost passing out, you know. Well, thank you, sir. <laughs> Hi, sir. <laughs> he knew I'd got sunburn. And that was way of his saying, you're a dumbass. You know, and, and actually, I could have brought up, been brought up on charges for dereliction of duty if that interfered with my duties. You know, so anyway, I got past all that and and it's another memory, you know. But so we get down to our little hole in the bottom of the ship and do writing letters, and off we go. And we're headed to Okinawa. I'll take a drink of water here, man. <clears throat> so we're on the way, co way to Okinawa. And I'm not sure how long it took to go from Hawaii to Okinawa, not that long. Um, but, you know, there was scuttlebutt that there might be some bad weather ahead, you know, from the um, old assaults on the ship or, you know, whatever they were picking up. And uh, as it turns out, we were almost to Okinawa and we hit a typhoon. And my perception of a typhoon was uh, it was going to be a little rain, maybe thunder. Well, this was basically a, a hurricane or some form of a bad hurricane. We hit that, and it was better down the hatches and hold on. There were Marines. Uh, I'd become accustomed to ship, and I hadn't thrown up as much as I <laughs> usually <laughs> did. Yeah, they were. Guys throwing up, falling, you know, trying to make it to the head or to the, to the bathroom, 
and uh, hold on to anything you would hold on. Guys running around in their skivvies, you know, just your underwear and praying, you know, we wouldn't tip over. I mean, it was going from side to side, you know, like this. Uh, it was bad. Um, I mean, equipment, supplies flying everywhere. Um, and so as, as things eventually calmed down, and we learned later from one of the uh, Navy guys, it might have been somebody that was on the bridge, that it got so bad that we almost tipped. I mean, this was he his version of saying, you know, when the bridge gets to a certain point, let you know, and it would have, it would have, it would have gone. So anyway, that was a uh, quite an experience. So we we made it to uh, Okinawa. We got to Okinawa, and it eventually I understood just being a stop a stopping off point. We weren't there for about a day, and we were allowed to uh, go to the uh, club there and have a few beers. Which was great. I mean, you know, we, you know, messed around and there was a place called uh, Kim Village, uh, kind of near the base, and you would, we were able to go into the Kim Village and meet the uh, excitement and uh, activities and a little sake or whatever you wanted to get involved in. Uh, but you got to be back by a certain time, you know, obviously. And so, uh, anyways, some of us made it back on time, some didn't. <laughs> and uh, some were able to walk and some weren't. So, anyway, we eventually, everybody gets back on board and we head out to Vietnam. Uh, again, it, it seemed like it didn't take that long to get to, uh, to Vietnam. Uh, we weren't sure at first what it was going to be like, you know, where we were going to storm the beach or to uh, basically... Um, you know, uh, step off the, the plank there, or the gate, or the plankway. But as it turns out, once everything was coordinated, we just had our gear with us, and you saw all the vehicles coming off and all this, it was right there on the beach in, near the name. Uh, you automatically seen some of the, uh, the locals, some of the people, the kids, and, and uh, anything from offering you a Coke to, uh, to whatever. Uh, again, it was, a, it was an experience uh, because you just culture shock, obviously. So, you know, uh, we get everybody together. We get on six by six by the trucks, and we're uh, transported into uh, a campsite or a... Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was, and I, and I could be wrong on it, it was, we were relieving the 3rd Battalion, 9th Marines, and I, I can't swear to that. <clears throat> so we get in the, uh, the camp there, and um, all these other Marines and Coleman and whoever else was in there, you know, strange looking people. Now, these are fellow Marines. Most of them are dark skinned, you know, no shirts on. Uh, I mean, real tan, strange, but they had a strange look about them, you know. And here we come in all white, and our, our new utilities or, you know, starts utilities coming in, uh, and, uh, and they're pointing fingers, you know, and, and, and all that changeover, you know, all that stuff that's uh, in the transition of things. When, and, when is uh, this? What year is this? This was 66. Okay. This was at the end of July 66, if, okay. if my dates are somewhere correct. Uh, <clears throat> and again, we really hadn't heard from the authorities up high or the powers to be exactly what, other than relieving this battalion, we were going to um, set up camp and whatever our positions were as far as mortars or, or, or assignments we were there to uh, uh, eventually support and just uh, maybe there were other battalions in the area. They would talk, they did talk about going on operations and you know, you had to be, prepare yourself for that. So once we got settled in and, and all the, and the guys that were eventually leaving were 
getting drunk and, you know, celebrating that they were leaving, going home. And uh, here we are, the, the newbies, you know, our, uh, the, uh, what was the thing? Uh, the, if, uh, it was F. Uh, FNG. Yeah, yeah, it was FNG. Uh, FNG blank new guys. Uh, so anyway, um, we got there and um, got to sign your, your I, I can't remember if it was a, might have been a, what they call a hooch or there were, you know, certain areas you could get three or four people in or, um, or whatever it was and there might have been a, a cot there and, and uh, whatever equipment you had, supplies, and then you just throw it in there and wait for your next orders. Uh, <clears throat> as, as times you were, you know, a lot of times you did get a hot meal. There was a mess tent set up. We got some hot meals. Um, we knew that we would probably be eating a lot of sea rations back then. Uh, this was the uh, older version of, of our the ready meals or mm -hmm. MRIs or whatever. Uh, so um, being in a mortar platoon again, 81 mortars, um, you were assigned to a, a a company, a rifle company. If if they went out on a, a in the field or in, in the operation, or it could have been an overnight um, operation. You know, you just you never knew which way you were going to go, or you had your support set up there in, in camp. You know, had mortar pits. You might have one or two or three mortars set up with a gun crew ready for fire missions for people out in the field. Or either if you were a section or squad, you would be assigned to that company and go where they go. You know, you would be part of that rifle company, the grunts, as we called them. Uh, and we were grunts. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. we weren't 0311, but we were 0341. We called ourselves super grunts because, in, in many ways, we would keep up with the rifle company and we would carry more equipment. Not only did we have to carry our, uh, our 81 mortar, but we had to carry ammo. And, you know, we carried the, you know, what they called either heat rounds or woolly pea or white phosphorus, white phosphorus, uh, and our regular equipment, you know, rifle, um, kink. Uh, I mean, you, you know, the whole nine yards. So uh, you had to be in, in pretty good shape to carry all that stuff, as we learned. And it was hot. I remember it was like California was one thing. But, when, you know, we, if you, you get into that environment, that, that atmosphere again, it was like something hit you in the face, like a big hot blast of something. And uh, it was just freaking hot. And um, did you so, know, did you know where you were? Yeah, we, like I say, we were in Da Nang. We okay. weren't that far. I don't want to say we were south of Da Nang, probably more north. Okay, if if I remember right, uh, we just weren't that far from the city of Da Nang uh, because we were weren't that far from the beach, South China or whatever. Uh, so we we're, we're getting settled in. You know, things are being drilled into us and kind of laid out for us. And uh, then it was a short time after uh, my squad, we got assigned a a hill. It was a, a small, well, I, I say it was a hill. I mean, not compared to some of the other hills we would uh, eventually get into. Uh, but it was a hill and we were uh, set up there. And uh, we were there for support, you know, while we had our mortar gun pit. We had a, a little hooch that we would, you know, bunker down in. Um, and then if we, we, we were able to call in fire missions to FDC back at the uh, rear, if you will, at the camp. And uh, so anyway, we were there. And we get a fire mission, whether it be night or day. But we also, you know, we're obviously a fear of, of where where the gooks were, where the VC were, or the 
at that time, you know, a lot of concentration on VC. Uh, not sure if we were really hearing about NVA that much. Um, but we eventually, we got hit a couple of times, you know, some mortar rounds coming in, RPGs. Uh, no, there was one, one time we got a, no, you know, I say a direct hit, it didn't really, it got pretty close. I mean, you know, right there close to the, to the uh, gun pit and there was a lot of, you know, diving in the bunker there or the hooch. We could, we, we, it was a bunker almost. And we was kind of crowded in there, but you know, we, we made do with it. Um, so, uh, as, as time rolled along, you know, this is uh, August and uh, time seems to go slow at first for me. Um, I let, you know, mail call was one of the biggest things, you know, when you were able to get care packages or mail from home. I got mail and care packages from my grandmother. Um, and she let me know that I was not writing her like I should and she was worried to death and all those things. But sometimes she was able to send me her famous pecan pie. And uh, needless to say, I had to share it with the rest of the squad. And uh, so I get, I might have gotten a piece out of it if I was lucky. And uh, any other items, you know, toiletries, anything else that you could have received. Uh, but so those times were good. Um, as as uh, operations go, you know, we we set out. Uh, well, let me back up. A lot of times we went out with a uh, a company at night, and uh, it was just you know we we stay as close as you can to them, but it was kind of scary in in one way or another. It, the mission or the thing didn't it didn't last that long, um, and then we went back to the rear, and then probably one of our first operations, and it was uh, near the name, but uh, you know, I forgot the name of the operation. But anyway, we went out and we stayed a few days. Uh, we didn't make any contact at first, and uh, you know you're carrying all this stuff, you're sweating, you're you know, we had salt pills, you know, to keep us, you know, replenish the salt. Um, you just, you know, you, you've got water and, you know, you're just drained and uh, you're not sure what's going on at first. And, uh, you know, you're listening to the radio, you're listening to um, maybe, you know, the company commander or, or uh, other radio jargon. <coughs> So we came back from that operation, and then we came back to where we were at Camp Da Nang, at uh, Da Nang, and the next thing you knew, we were reported we were moving to Fubai, which is a little bit north. We ended up loading up, we moved to Fubai, and this was, a, I forget which camp it was, but it was, a, it was a nicer setup. They had actually wooden, like the individual uh, little houses or barracks, if you will, then they had about maybe six or eight bunks in them, you know, cots laid out, no bunks, but just racks. And it was netted, and uh, it was really nice, I mean, compared to what we had seen. Uh, so the um, adventures go on. Our outfit, um, we went on a operation, and the rumor was we were gonna stay on this thing for, 30 days or, or thereabout, or whatever it called for. It was a seek and uh, destroy or a search and destroy type thing. And uh, so we started out, I think uh, we left and we went in by uh, sea lights, went into troop helicopters and they landed us in wherever it was. So we get off, you know, we deboard that and uh, we, we start hiking or we're going through this. And you know, it, kind of a long story short is that during this operation, doing all the, the scary times and uh, 
you know, not sure and what's going to happen and wait and see if you're going to make a contact. We never made contact. It was just a kind of a dry run for us from what I remember. <clears throat> As we were coming back from this operation and before we were going to our LZ or to get picked up or whatever, we stopped at these, there was an old fortified bunker that the French had left there, you know, cement bunker, whatever. Couldn't really get inside, but on the top of it, you could sit down and kind of a look over uh, the rice paddies and you know, see. The whole battalion was set up, and we, my squad leader, excuse my uh, platoon sergeant, another squad leader, and myself were sitting on top of the bunker. And, and we got to remember, we're, you know, FNGs, you know, <laughs> we're new guys. And uh, we're sitting there eating some uh, sea rations and having a little heat tab, you heating them up. And I had my, my backpack and my rifle and helmet and everything laying there and kind of all my web gear taken off, you know. And so was everybody else. And you know, people were all around the bottom of the bunker. And like I say, battalion, heck, they just kind of set up all around us. And uh, just taking a big break. I, I don't know if it had rained some or, you know, I think it had rained a little bit. And it was kind of muddy around us. Well, the next thing I know, I hear like a pop. And there no pop. I said, oh shit. And somebody yelled, incoming. And the corporal, the last corporal, another squad leader, he went that way. I went this way, dove. I, I, in the meantime, I, I don't think I grabbed my rifle. But anyway, the staff sergeant, he laid in prone position. He went flat on the bunker. And so, and there was a few more shots, but I actually felt the bullets whizzed by my head. I mean, I can truly say that first time I'd ever been shot at. So anyway, I'm <laughs> edging around the back of the bunker along with some other people and the other squad leader, and I was able to reach up and grab my rifle. And you know, at the time, and the sergeant, he's still sitting on laying on the bunker. His name was Sergeant Sudo, and he said, "Craig, I'm hit. I'm hit." I said, where you, where, where you hit at? My leg, man, my leg. And so I dragged him back behind the bunker. And you know, I'm feeling his leg and he's feeling it. And uh, there's something warm and wet on his leg. I'm looking around. I said, you're not hit. That's your beans and franks, your sea rations. He, they were hot. He was heating them up. He said, oh, thank God, man. By that time, you know, the, the shots had stopped by that time. <laughs> anyway, we were trying to hold it in, but we couldn't stop from laughing. Anyway, and my, I had my, my M14, you know, with me. And by that time, the battalion commander and all the other COs and everybody that was coming our way, and um, but by that time, see, they had already, I think, there was a few shots out in that direction from us, but no big, you know, mortars going out that way, nothing. But anyway, so we're standing there, and my rifle, and the sergeant Zudo says, Craig, what happened to your rifle? Said, what are you doing about it? He said, look at it. There's a hole in the stock. You know, I said, oh, crap. So that thing had been sitting beside my leg, and one of the sniper bullets got it. So I was, you know, blessed. Uh, so, <laughs> and actually the battalion commander had come by and heard that I'd got my rifle shot up. And so he wanted to see my, see my, my uh, wounded rifle. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, that was a big event. But it, what happened was there was a, uh, a sniper, had a little what you call a patch, come out, shot a few rounds, went back under his little thing there. And but that was our first experience with uh, being shot at, sniper. So time rolls along and uh, we, uh, like I said, we were in Fubai. 
We end up going to, uh, you know, moving a little bit further north, I think. And this, this goes into September, October, probably. And then, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tony, monsoons, you yeah, know, was, they, yeah. it was about time for the monsoons, yeah. if, if I'm correct. And all I remember was just, it rained. <laughs> it, it rained. And it rained. And uh, we go on other operations. Uh, one of the operations, and this was right before Christmas. And we were on operation and we were behind our rifle company's company, Echo Company, I think it was. And so we were going around some rice paddies and some um, some docks and we, I, for some reason or another, I had got in point, which I normally don't do, and there was a, one of the sergeants from uh, the Edward Mortars had, was behind me, and the rest of the squad was, and we were trying to make sure we were in line with the rifle company. <clears throat> I was walking along, you know, I was carrying the sight box, my M14, my I had some rounds on my backpack and stepped in very carefully. And I don't know, you know, you just, you, well, I made my step with my right foot. And we had jungle boots by that time, real jungle boots. And I just felt something like it wasn't, you know, part of nature or something, but something, and I froze. And I, I kind of looked down, and I could see what looked to be fishing wire or something. And uh, and I, you know, nothing like that. And I, I said, it was a Sergeant Gonzalez, little short Hispanic guy. And uh, he come up, and I said, take it easy. I said, I think I. On a booby trap, um, I'm on. A, I'm, I'm on a wire. I mean, if I move, you know, don't get too close to me. You know, until the rest of the squad to fall back. So uh, I, uh, I laid down my gear the best I could. He took my rifle and helped me get my pack off very slowly. And. Um, you know, at that time, you were just all kinds of things were running through your mind. Obviously, I'm scared shitless. I mean, excuse me, but I'm I'm just panicking inside, and obviously it's shown at some outside. And the sergeant trying to console me, saying, "Just take it easy, man. We'll 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 get it. Don't worry. I got it." And uh, again, it, it it was seemed like an eternity. But he was able to get to the other side, and it was a Chakon, a Chinese grenade, and he was able to disarm it. And um, I'm sure I, you could see relief all over me. I had to go in my backpack and change my skivvies, you know, <laughs> to stay the least. Uh, so anyway, uh, so you know, it was it was a. A big moment, but it passed, you know, because you're, hey, we got to catch up, you know. We we got in touch with the uh, rifle company, what had happened, and uh, I think uh, the Sarge, Sarge Goss, he uh, actually, but besides, he disarmed it, but he it still had been he threw the pin and it went off or whatever. That yeah. part of the shotgun grenade, and so cause they they fired the hole, and anyway, off we went. And it continued the operation. We stayed. Uh, that it wasn't thirty days, but it seemed like forever. We stayed in the parts of the of the rest of the jungle. I don't know if we were side of a the hill or mountain or whatever. Uh, we came back and we were soaking wet. I mean, obviously. I mean, it was just you never could get dry. We try to keep some dry socks if nothing else. Cold and, and and cold, you know. I mean, you had your poncho, your uh, your heat pads at times when you had 
you were able to take a break and, and heat up some sea rations maybe. And a lot of times uh, I was on guard duty all my time and, uh, you know, I've come together perimeter and uh, in the rain. I remember one time I was smoked back then and naturally you couldn't light up a cigarette and open. And I was under my poncho and the rain coming down and I, I could had a little people I could see out of my hood, uh, but I was going to take a quick cigarette break. And I took my Zippo lighter and I lit up a camel. And I just was out of the sea ration past old World War II Korean cigarettes, probably non, non filter. I was hardcore back then. I could smoke a non filter cigarette. So anyway, I light up and I take it. Hey man, that was great. And then I put it out, you know, before anybody could see me. Uh, I mean, things like that, you know, you just you never know, thought you'd be doing something like that. And, uh, but, you know, you're trying to get dry, but you're not dry. So anyway, how are we doing on time, Tony? We're good. We're about an hour and 15 minutes into it. So we got about 15 minutes left. 15 minutes okay. left, yeah. I, so one of the other experiences other than, you know, you're going through the jungles, you know, whether it's hot and dry uh, or wet and cold. I remember going through the canopy of the jungle one time. It was, it was sun bright, but you couldn't really, it was dark, you know what I mean? The, and you look out for insects and spiders, and I get bit, I bit by a scorpion one time. And it, I, I mean, and I'm not talking about a little scorpion, I'm talking about a giant scorpion as far as I was concerned. It made me sick, the corpsman gave me something, and I was better, but anyway. Um, so that operation was uh, was complete, and um, there was a couple other operations that went on with the 26 Marines. Uh, I know one time we were ending an operation, and uh, we had received uh, one the ambush, but we received a lot of fire, some RPGs, and mortars uh, up front, and. Um, we had some medevacs. None of my guys were, were hurt at that time. And uh, anyway, I, somehow or another, I got in the front of where the medevac was taking place. And uh, the enemy had some KIA and uh, WIA wounded. And there were some uh, female goose, female Viet Cong. They were nurses and they were wounded. By that time, we had changed over to M16s. And I don't know if she got hit by an M79 grenade or round or an M16, but the captain was kind of taken over and he said, get these on the helicopter and, you know, uh, and he was pointing out the, the, the females, you know, soft heart for the wounded females, I don't know. And he said, Craig, grab that one. Well. I picked her up in my arms, and her arm was about blown off. And she was saying, uh, surrender, I think, in uh, Hanoi or... Uh, joy? Joy, that's it, yes. And, um, I mean, she was about out of it, but... And I got her on the uh, chopper. And, uh, and there was another one, one of the other guys was bringing another one wounded. But I never forget, it wasn't loading our guys on there. We had some guys on there, but it was some reflections, you know, why we putting the enemy on there? Uh, I don't know if they ever made it to base or to uh, uh, the base uh, hospital or not, but anyway. So uh, that operation was over. Um, went on another operation. Somewhere around December, I got r and &R. I went to Bangkok, Thailand. Had a great time. I'm not going to go into all the details, uh, but there was a place called Whiskey, a go-go, and uh, I had my whiskey and I, I go go <laughs> okay? <laughs> and uh, I had a um, a friend that go go with me, I'll put it that way. And the uh, rest of my guys were on R with me and we, we had a good time. And uh, as it turns out, it, it, coming back from R&R, &R, uh, there was uh, some transfers taking place within the battalion. 
Second Battalion, 4th Marines, was ahead of us farther up north. Uh, myself and several of, of my guys that were in the uh, squad, in the, the 81 mortars, and from the rifle companies, we were being transferred to 2nd Battalion, 5th, 4th Marines. I didn't know exactly where they were, I just knew they were up north. So we headed north, the ones that were being transferred uh, was by, probably by, I don't think it was by Chopper, we by six, or six by us. We met them, got to their uh, camp, wherever they were, uh, got indoctrinated with, you know, who you're going to be with and what platoon, uh, rifle company and all that. As it turns out, I got promoted to corporal during this time. Uh, I had some of the other guys that were my squad members, they went to a different squad or, or whatever. Uh, and uh, I was assigned to whatever rifle company, I was assigned to the uh, CO, the captain. I always went, and I had a radio operator, but I was with the artillery FO. Okay. And that was, that was good for me because first few missions or operations I went out on with the uh, rifle company, um, the artillery FO was Sergeant Foster, Paul Foster. He, he was instrumental in guiding me along about fire missions, about, I mean, so, I knew. So you were the 81 FO? I was the 81 FO, okay. and Paul was the artillery FO. Um, and sometimes he would call an airstrike if, if we needed one. Uh, so we were on the operations. We, you know, came in contact a lot. Uh, we did fire missions, you know, looking for the the enemy and calling in fire missions. And uh, it was a whole, obviously, that was a whole new experience for me because I wasn't, you know, a squad leader no more. I was up front more. I was been more engaged, if you will. Um, and uh, so um, that was a, a lot of, um, you know, operations and, you know, jungle time and, and uh, you know, and, I, and everybody looks back on it and say, oh man, I spent a tour in Vietnam and I made it back home okay, you know. And I spent my full 12 months or more over there and uh, I didn't get wounded. Now I got knocked off my feet from, you know, blast and I, you know, just different things. I never got any strap, no. I got shot at, as I told you about. I tripped over booby traps. Uh, obviously somebody was looking down on me. Guardian angels, blessed, and uh, so forth. So, um, I was down on an operation uh, with the same company uh, as time went along and you know, naturally they had gun pits, mortar gun pits up in the uh, in the rear. Some of the guys that were, three of the guys that were my squad members happened to be loading some ammo on the mules, from the mules, you remember the mules, mm -hmm. and taking rounds and putting it in a gun pit. I never really found out what happened other than a faulty round, heat rounds or Willie Peter round. One went off, and uh, anyway, it was, uh, there was four guys in there that I knew, and they were gone. And so, anyway, that hit close to home, and uh, there was one other time, there was a, and right before that time, there was one other incident, how it is to lose one of your close to you. There was a young kid, uh, they had just come to the Secretary of Fourth Marines, and he had signed to our uh, the platoon. Well, I was at uh, FDC, and I was still forward reserve, but I was helping call in a fire mission. Well, what happened, one of the fire crews, one of the fire pits, was doing a fire mission. The other fire pit may have been over here, the other gun crew. Anyway, there was a misfire. And uh, I was there where the D.C. was, and when I heard it, it was at nighttime, and I heard it say misfire, 
And everybody, God knows where's it going. It went into the next company. It didn't explode ammo for, I don't know how it did that, but it wounded the kid that had just got assigned, new guy, and he was from, uh, name was uh, Billy Nixon, and he was from Texas. And uh, anyway, that fire mission had ended, and uh, you know, naturally, those things do happen. Friendly fire, mm -hmm. whatever. So he got a medevac, and uh, we got word later he died. And uh, it was just, you know, I'm, I'm a, by that time, I'm a, I'm a, been there in country for a long time. I'm tanned, you know, I'm, uh, you know, and as time rolls, I'm getting short, you know, this is probably June, July, because I got transferred around the beginning of the year, June, July. Uh, so in August, I know I'm going, I'm supposed to be going home. So uh, as the time gets close to, you know, getting ready to be marked for saying going home, I get in the rear. They, they put you in the rear. You're not going anywhere. And uh, so I get home uh, eventually, you know, the Okinawa, then Los Angeles, Los Angeles, and I go to Atlanta first. And uh, see, meet my family, uh, and then I eventually I, I go there for a few days, and I go to North Carolina to my grandmother's, mm -hmm. meet my cousins, my friends, and uh, and just uh, have a have a good welcome home to a certain extent, but without going into detail, I didn't at the airport, for example. You know how we got treated in Los Angeles, particularly. It was just, you know, they say you eventually change it into your civvies. But, and you don't tell anybody, you know. They say, well, you're in the service. Yeah, but, you know, you've been to Vietnam. But, you know, just all those things that are bombarded at you. Because, you know, you don't know for sure what's happening here stateside. Mm -hmm. And it was just such a, another culture shock. You're back in, you're back home, uh, the world, as we call it. Uh, so anyway, I know we're getting short on time, but as time rolls along, um, I uh, I meet a girl, uh, and she, you know, we, I, I, I'm not saying this is, it happens often. She got pregnant, and uh, we get married, and uh, our first child is Tammy, and uh, I, uh, I'm doing some odd jobs here and there. Um, and then I see a friend that I knew from Vietnam. He was with the Atlanta Police Department. And they were recruiting, having a recruiting, recruiting effort over at Luton Square. And um, he said, Craig, he may want you to take an application once you join the police department or go put your application in. And I did, and one thing led to another, and I, I got with the Atlanta Police Department. So I went from one uniform into another eventually. Uh, my wife and I eventually, uh, we have another child, Scott. Uh, we, I stayed with Atlanta for about five years. And I'm like, right before I, I make a change, I'm assigned to Fulton County, unincorporated area, north and south. And I'm working on the north side. And this is the time that Fulton County is wanting to split from, from Atlanta and formed their own police department and fire department. And so I'm, you asked to say, I stayed with them. I resigned from Atlanta and started a new thing with, I'm not actually new. Most of the guys that were working in the counties, the North and South, uh, stayed with them and uh, like myself. They stayed with Fulton County. I stayed with them 28 years and retired. So early retirement, Get out, the uh, 96, 96, about the time for the Olympics, I get a job through a friend of mine working security for one of the big oil companies to come to the Olympics. Uh, I'm, I'm a civilian now, but I'm, I can still wear a uniform at that time they could. And uh, so I'm working a job, I'm retired, but, and uh, make a lot of money from that particular job. So anyway, so, 
Um, back in 1998, a friend of mine had uh, made sure up in Forsyth County, Georgia. He'd been trying to get me to come up there. And I said, I don't want to get back in law enforcement. As it turns out, I eventually make a decision two years into his uh, administration to go up there. I go up there as a captain, and I'm, I'm in charge of the court system. But I'd retired as a lieutenant from Fulton County PD. But anyway, I'm up there as a captain. Re-election comes up. Everything's looking good, you know. Uh, by that time, he had made me a major. I'm in charge of one division. Uh, anyway, I had been chief deputy filling in for him because he had had some health problems. and So I was kind of bouncing around from one chore to the next. Re-election comes up, he loses. Long story short, but and I'm out, you know, out the door too. So in 2001, uh, I decided, right after 9-11, I decided to form a private investigative agency, private detective, and I got into that. I think 16, 17 years ago, 16. And uh, been piddling around with that, so to speak. Um, got involved with a lot of veterans organizations, Marine Corps League, uh, Atlanta, Vietnam Veterans and, uh, Business Association, uh, a few more, American Legion. Right. I just got involved in a lot of stuff, probably overwhelmed me. I decided to make a move to the mountains. Wife and I moved up toward Jasper. And uh, I've kind of, uh, well, let me you know, set right there is that as we were moving, getting ready to get stuff out of storage after we got the house, uh, I found out I had cancer. I got cancer in my left kidney. I uh, found out in August of last year, in September, September they had uh, surgery, got my kidney out, got the cancer out, and I'm blessed again. God's looking down on me from back when I was 19, 20, 21, whatever it was, and to, to, to now. I mean, you can't, I mean, what can you say? Uh, so, uh, work, and working PI stuff is kind of taking its course, deciding whether I want to I'll take a case if I feel like doing it. I also work with the uh, Missing Children Center uh, as a volunteer, team editing consultant, and project alert volunteer. Uh, so whenever they need me, I do some training with them every now and then. Um, so, and then whatever else the wife tells me to do up there. So I try to since the surgery and and and, re, and recovering from. The surgery and all the effects from that and being blessed not to have to go through chemo right, and yeah. radiation. But one quick thing, how I found the cancer was amazing. I had a stomach issue. I said, what? I had stomach flu maybe. And we got so bad, it was really hurting. And uh, wife took me up to the hospital in Jasper and they got me in the UR and X-rays and scans. Oh, what's wrong? You know, they said it was a bowel blockage. I said, what's a bowel blockage anyway? Um, bowel or bowel, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. and that's how they found the cancer. They saw something on my kidney, and that's how it came about. And I got, I stayed in the hospital there for five days, to go through the obstruction that they had found. I got through all that, and then went through the surgery about a month later. So. That's how it came about, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Okay. So. We appreciate it. And we I thank you for, for taking the time to tell your story. Yeah. And thank you for your service. Well, appreciate that. Tony. Take thank care you. of yourself. Thank you. Welcome home. Thank you. As we say. Thank you. Good. All right. Was I too